We're ready to go? Ready to go. Welcome to church this morning, everyone. Good to have you here on a chilly morning. Uh, Darren will get up and uh, lead us in worship shortly. Before he does that, I just want to talk about the trivia night. So that's coming up. It's two weeks' time, so on the 20th of July. Uh, it's going to be here in the church. Um, the RSVP date, well, I should actually say, so it's Steve Horman is coming to run the night for us. So just really want to emphasize that that's Steve Horman, not Matt Horman. It's Steve Horman running it, so please, please turn up. It'll actually be good. Um, yeah, so 20th of July, uh, it's here. The RSVP date is today, I think. Um, so if you haven't RSVP'd, uh, let me know if you're coming along. My email address and my phone numbers and staying in touch too, so just flick us a message. Um, it's not a hard RSVP date, so if you've got friends that you're waiting on that you've invited along or you're not sure if you can come or you change your mind in the next couple of weeks, just let me know. It won't be an issue. We'll fit you in. Um, but just for the sake of us organising it, if you can let us know as soon as possible, that'll be good. Uh, we're going to have a kids program running, so out in the other room. Um, we'll have a movie and stuff going on out there just so that it makes it easier for you not to have to find babysitters. We need a couple of volunteers to help supervise that too. So uh, if you're not into trivia, or you're trying to avoid trivia, but you'd like to come along and hang out with your church family still, then um, come and speak to me or someone on the events team, and we'll get you into that. I think that's all. Uh, any other questions, just come and speak to me or one of the events team, and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Phil. Good morning, all. It's uh, good to be together. I think the heat is working, isn't it, Brandon? It is. So uh, it was a chilly start to the morning, apparently, but the, the heater is fixed. Uh, if you're just visiting, you know, well, you don't know the deal. Let me tell you the deal. Uh, after church, we have morning tea. If you need to use any of the amenities within the church, just out through those um, doors, double doors, grey doors, cry room, toilets, etc. Uh, and you know about the trivia night, which is next. Uh, no, not next, Saturday week, the 20th. Before then, so next Friday and Saturday, uh, the Church and Nation Committee has a, um, a conference, which they have every year, called, uh, someone will tell me what, Living as Truth Matters. That's what it's called. I'm going. I should know that. Um, there's about three or four blokes from North going. Uh, so Ben's going, Kevin, I think, uh, Jack might have mentioned... Um, if anyone wants to go, it's Friday and Saturday. I've actually got a spare ticket for both Friday and Saturday. Uh, so if anyone wanted to go, uh, please see me. And uh, it's always a worthwhile time, just helping us to think about how to engage in culture and politics, etc. And then just a reminder, after that, because it's a busy July, the next Saturday, two Saturdays after that, which is the 27th of July, the Men of God Conference is at the PTC. So if you're interested in going to that, I'm sure there'll be some blokes going from here. You can jump in a car, head out to the Theological College. And uh, Luke McSeveny is one of the speakers, and Russ Grinter from Reformers in Presbyterian, uh, Reformers Presbyterian in Bendigo is also another speaker. So great opportunities for ministry and doing things together as the people of God. Uh, make use of that. Well, I'm going to lead you in prayer, but before I do, we've been thinking about peace, and um, today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 to 9, where it talks about walking with the God of peace. And here's what Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews, probably Luke says, uh, Hebrews 13 and verses 20 to 21, now... May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's pray. Now, Father, we, we thank you that through Christ you have made peace possible with yourself in the sending of your Son who has taken up 
our sin and unrighteousness, our lack of obedience, our lack of virtues. And he has taken them all and he has nailed them to the cross. And on the third day, he rose again, according to Scripture, for our justification. So that we could know and have confidence that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And also, if we were to confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, and you would forgive us and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Please do that even now. Please forgive our sin. Please forgive our lack of love and grace and patience. Forgive our harsh words in our families with our children. Forgive our thoughts that fall short of that which is good and godly and helpful. Forgive our desires which are inordinate or disordered. So that as we gather as the people of God this morning, there would be nothing that would be a stumbling block to your blessing upon us. And help us, we pray, that as we gather in the name of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, that our worship, indeed ourselves, our families, that they might be acceptable to you as we offer them up as a living sacrifice. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first song this morning. Uh, It's a new song, so uh, that requires you to uh, be bold in your singing. Don't be quiet, Um, although don't lead us astray. Actually, no, that's, that's your responsibility. Do not lead us astray, all right? So that's on you. you all, uh, are you going to do like an intro or we are just going to just jump into it? What are you doing? Right, okay. So you heard the new song. Um, we'll be singing together, The Shepherd. And then after that, uh, Matt Heyman's going to be doing our catechism. Thanks, ladies.
Could be, could be dangerous. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Welcome to Catechism. I am the Mad Hatter today. Don't look at me funny. Rude. How are we this morning? Oh, we've got a few empty seats. Light on kids. It'd be quiet today, won't it? You are very quiet. You didn't even answer my question. All right, today, as you can see, I'm wearing many hats. Now, there's a, there's a saying, like, when you wear many hats, it means you do many things. So I have many hats. Like, when your teacher asks you to put on your thinking hats, do you actually put on a hat? What do you do? What, when they say you put on your thinking hat, what are you trying to do? <laughs> Think. You're trying to do something. And your teacher says, I want you to put on your thinking hat. So you've got to think, oh, I've got to actually do some thinking. I'm going to work out a problem. Now, I've met many hats as well. And Christ had many hats. He had many things that he did. And that's what you learned yes, uh, last week, not yesterday. Last week. It, the question was, Mr. Saviot did it. Okay, and he asked, what does Christ do for his people? And he had three hats, and there was actions to go with these three hats. Can everybody remember? We have this one here. What's that one represent? So Christ does the work of a prophet. Nice work. So he had three hats, three hats. I have many hats. I have this hat. Anybody know what this hat is? Can you read on it? Oh, does it, have the, it should have a name on it. Wait, wait a second. There you go. What does that say? Can anybody read that? Kids at the back. Nobody knows. Chef. Yes, believe it or not, that was my past life before I did teaching. I was a chef and I used to have to wear one of these hats. I probably don't have to wear it now because what this hat used to do was stop my hair from falling into the food. Not something I really have to worry about these days. These other hats, I have other things that I do. I, like I said, I told you I teach. Does anybody remember what I teach? Some would say I don't teach because I teach this subject. What do I do? Sport. So I wear one of these because I'm always outside. So I need to wear one of these hats and I wear one of those because that represents my work. I have other hats. I have a family hat. Okay. Might not, I actually don't wear a hat when I'm doing my family business. But as a parent, and that's what Mr. Savio did last week as well, he drew parents up and said, what do you do for your kids? Hello. Um. You're hungry. Yeah. 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 See, I feed my kids obviously not enough in some cases. But what we're going to learn today is why. Why do I wear these hats? So I told you why I wore these hats. Now we're going to look at why Christ wears his hat so, uh, and what he does with those hats. Okay, so the first one was a, whoa, a good catch, see? PE gear coming in. All right, the first one was a prophet. So now we're going to look at what, so it should come up, there we go. Why is Christ a prophet? So why do I wear this hat? I wear this hat to keep my hair in, which I don't need to do anymore. I wear this hat to protect me from the sun. Why is Christ, pardon me, <coughs> why is Christ a prophet? What does he do that makes him a prophet? Does anybody know? This has, this is a clue. What is this? When, when you do this action for a prophet, what are, you, what are you actually, what are your hands representing? You know? The Bible. What's in the Bible? What does the Bible tell us? About Jesus. That's right. It tells us about Jesus and it tells us about what he expects us to do or what we call the will of God. So we read the Bible to find out the will 
of God. Okay? And so when we read it and we read about Jesus, okay, we learn from Jesus. So in a way, Jesus is teaching us his will or the will of God. Okay? And that's the, that's the idea behind a prophet. A prophet is somebody who teaches other people about the will of God. And so Jesus does that for us in the Bible. And I think that's where the answer will come up. Ignore the question 60, uh, the 60. It is actually question 61. So that on uh, catechism next week. Don't get confused. You are on 62, not on 61. Okay, so why is Christ a prophet? Because he teaches. Good, now it came up. There you go. Good, he teaches us the will of God. Okay, so we need to listen to him so we know what God's will is for us. Does that make sense? Thumbs up? We're very quiet today. All right, well, let's pray and ask that he helps us to do that because we need Jesus' help and we need God's help as well. All right, let's pray. Let's bow our heads, hands together. We're going to pray. Close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that in it uh, we can see Jesus teaching us your will uh, for our lives. We do pray, Lord, that you will soften the hearts of the, the kids in front of us and all of us here, and that you will open our eyes and our ears to listen to what you have to tell us and where you want us to go and what you want us to do with our lives. And Lord, part of your will is to be more Christ-like. So we pray that you help us to do that, for we are a sinful people and we need your help uh, to be more like Christ because he is perfect and he is our, our leader and the one that shows us how to behave. And so we ask that you help us in that area. And we ask it all in his name. Amen. Beautiful. 1098, let's get singing. Loud voices and really blast off. You know, you've been a bit quiet with the blast offs the last couple of weeks. You can stand up. Morning, all. Um, grab your Bibles out. Today's reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. Um, so this book is in the New Testament, um, snuggled between Corinthians and Ephesians, if you're having trouble, and it's a nice book. So if you need to count along. Um, this book is written by Paul, and it's a letter to the churches in Galatia who were quite young churches and susceptible to outsiders. Um, so I'll just read that. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. We've got your Bibles uh, open still or your phones turned on. Uh, Jump over to Philippians 4. You remember we've been spending uh, what seems like months uh, in the book of Philippians. We're coming towards the end. Uh, Remember this is a this is a uh, a friendship letter, and Paul is writing to that church. You remember the big theme is is rejoicing. Uh, Fourteen times uh, they're exhorted to rejoice in the Lord, and then just in this last section, chapter four, we saw that Paul uh, painted a path. Uh, to peace in conflict, and then also in anxiety. Uh, last Lord Day, we looked at that. And, and today, he's going to show you how you can walk with the God of peace. How does that actually happen? What does that look like? Uh, so if you've got your Bibles open, I'm just going to read to you verses 8 and 9, and we'll conclude that section. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And nine, this is the word of God. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let's, um, let's pray and then we'll think about God's word. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, thank you for scripture. We thank you for the book to the church at Philippi. We pray now as we meditate just on these uh, two verses that you would give us understanding for our minds. Uh, Give us hunger and thirst uh, for your word and your righteousness and that your spirit would tarry with each one of us so that we might hear the spirit of God say to us, this is the way, walk in it. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you uh, realize this or not, but virtues and vices are like pieces of a jigsaw that form a whole. Um, If you throw up your picture in the back, there you are, you'll see it. So so that picture behind me, um, maybe not quite as dramatic as that, but you are all made up of virtues and vices. And, and, and by grace, through gospel grace, increasingly in your Christian life, what you're doing, you're adding virtues to your faith. That is the fruit of the Spirit, which uh, Katie read to us about. The virtues we were taking off and the virtues we are putting on. And as you do that, the, the mind of Christ has been formed in you as you renew your mind and your affections, your desires, that is. Your loves are continually recalibrated by the gospel. And then what you do, as we've been seeing in our text of Philippians, you, you learn how to lean into Christ in prayer at times of anxiety rather than seeing creeping darkness. We look to the window on our right, and we see God's glorious, gracious hand. And then that jigsaw puzzle, increasingly, from the day of your conversion till the trumpet sounds or death 
takes you home, you are gradually and surely transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. And, and the vices are removed and the virtues are what replaces them. It is the work of God's Spirit graciously in you. This is how you walk with the God of peace. You know, the, the God of peace who secured your peace on a cross at Golgotha, the God who actually enables you to enjoy peace in times of conflict, or as we've seen the last few Lord's Day, conflict with each other, but also anxiety within ourselves. The same God Paul is saying here is with you. And he's there as God's people to bless you, renew you, refresh you, sustain you. To actually walk with you. That's, that's, that should be your mental picture. That Christ has called me to himself and, 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 and God will walk with me through this life. For I am with you, he says, even to the end of the ages. I am with you in times when you're caught up in conflict with each other even. I'm with you when you are anxious. I'm with you in joy and pain and loss and gain and, and in loneliness, but also in community. Now, now, that's the promise. That's actually the truth. But it's also true that at times, God does feel distant. Just as there are times when experientially you, you, you sense that he is close and near. And yet we've got to hold those experiences with the reality that God is omniscient. And he is omnipresent. This all-powerful, all-knowing God, he, he, he he doesn't have to find you on a Google map. He knows where you are because he is everywhere, all of the time. It's just that you may not see him or experience him. Remember how we said about anxiety? You look out the window, out the front, there's creeping darkness. But if you tilt your head to the right, at least if you live in my house at about 6 o'clock at night, you would see the setting sun over Churnside Park. And there, the huge, beautiful hues in the sky of a setting sun remind you of God's gracious, glorious hand. See, God is, is like invisible ink. It's always there. He's always there, even if you don't see it, don't feel it, don't experience it. I don't know about you. I can vaguely remember when I was a kid, but I, I do remember once one, one Christmas present or birthday present. I don't know. It could have been my brothers and I stole it. But anyway, you know when you get those little science kits, and one of the things in the science kit was um, it had invisible ink. And it was awesome. It was like it, 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 was, it was magic. It wasn't science, it was magic. And so you would, you would get the invisible ink. Ironically, you could see the ink, but that's all right. But you take the invisible ink and you would write on a page, and then voila, it just disappeared. No one could see it. And you could write, like, not that I did this, kids, block your ears. You could write rude words to your brother, right, in invisible ink. And if you were to look, if your mum and dad found your invisible ink book with your invisible messages to your brother, they'd go, nothing happening here, eh? Right? Yeah. Until you put the secret chemical on the page. And then, whoa, poof, like magic, the words appeared. My brother's a buffhead or... That's the sanctified version. It was something probably not as nice as that. But the truth is, those words were always there on the page, right? They were always there. Just needed the right conditions to reveal it. Simply, God is always there. Verse 
There is nowhere that he is not present. From heaven to Hades, mountaintops to the deepest valleys, from the creepiest, creeping darkness to the most glorious sunset or dawn, he is there. Yet Paul says in Romans 15.33, May, may, may the God of peace be with you all. And when Paul writes may, he's acknowledging that the experience of God's peace, the awareness of his presence, the enjoyment of his fellowship, that because it's may, it's sort of in a sense, it's conditional. It may not actually realize for you. You may not actually experience it or be aware of it or enjoy it. Because it can be compromised by conflict, anxiety, disbelief, sin, all the things that he's been talking about in Philippians. Sort of how... You remember in, in Genesis 3, in verse 8, and we assume that, that, that before the fall that Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. It's a picture of the closeness and the presence, and they're aware of that. But then they sin, they disobey. And verse 8 says that they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. We, we, it's funny, isn't it? Because we often think that God's hiding, but in reality, at times like that, it's, it's often we are hiding. Our sin causes us to hide, to crouch. Anxiety, it erases God from the equation. It's just you and your worries. Disbelief convinces us that, you know, God cannot actually help. Conflict actually erodes the enjoyment of our peace. And so Paul in, in Philippians 4, having shown us the path to peace in, in, in conflict and anxiety, he wants to remind us how you walk with that God of peace. Because peace is much more than the sort of absence of conflict and anxiety. There is no conflict and anxiety in a graveyard. Not unless you dig in the graves, but I'm assuming not the people think, but, but there's no conflict and anxiety in a graveyard. You read the headstone, rest in peace. Well, that is not what we're talking about here. The experience of peace, of God's shalom, to experience it is actually, it requires activity. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers, finally, we're getting there right towards the end of the letter. And brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever, if there's anything excellent, there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you want to walk with the God of Shalom, if you want to experience His peace, have an awareness of His presence, if you want to enjoy His fellowship, it actually starts with your thought life. Where you park your mind when things occasionally get quiet. Where do you park your mind? See, this is, what, this is about spiritual formation. It begins with the intentional, active control over what you actually choose to think about. Sort of like, um, like my Land Rover, uh, as you know, has no roof, doors. Has no canopy. You can't lock my Land Rover. I right? can't lock it. So that means uh, all those Geelong supporters could easily uh, steal my car. Probably a bit classy for Geelong supporters, frankly, but not to worry. And, and not only, not only does it not have a roof that stops people from stealing it, doesn't have a roof so that. In the 10 months of Geelong's weather, when it's normally rainy and cold, 
There's, there's no protection. So when you've got an old 1963 roofless Land Rover, you need to be intentional where you park your car. You have to think about, would it get stolen here? Someone just can just jump in, start the car. Or what if it rains when I'm out? Is the car sort of going to get flooded with water? There's a requirement of, of being intentional in your thinking. So it is with God. You, you need to be intentional. If you want to walk with the God of peace, Paul says you have to think about what you think, where you park your mind. And he's encouraging you to wrestle with what is virtuous. Fill your minds with what is good. What is true? First, that's what he says. Whatever is true, think about that. Because truth is beautiful. Think it, speak it, love it. It sets you free, the truth. Unless your wife says, do I look fat in this dress? Then don't. That's not a time. The truth will not set you free then. My wife never has to ask that question, just clarifying that point. She would never have to ask that question. Think about what is honourable. In other words, what is noble, what is decent. Think, think about your elders or your deacons or the woman who serves well in the church or the elderly widow who prays and serves and loves well. Think about what is noble, what is decent. He says, think about justice, things which are just. What, what is right, what is fair. You should be thinking about filling your mind with that. How can, how can I work towards justice? The way the world should be. You turn your mind to that. It might lead you to do good to your neighbor, or it might lead you into politics, but you think about what is just. For the weak, for the poor, for the homeless. As opposed to, say, partiality or prejudice or favoritism. Paul, Paul urges them, he says, think about what's pure. Whatever is pure. The idea is whatever is holy, whatever is free of defilement. Well, you know, like my, my kids on the the family chat, they'll, they'll send a video of something good, uh, pure, we would say. They would never say, what are they? They all say, ooh, wholesome, wholesome. <laughs> they think they're cool using a, you know, this really old school language, biblical, wholesome. In other words, the opposite of that would be dirty or defiled or corrupted. Think about what is wholesome. He says, and whatever's lovely, whatever's pleasant or enjoyable, think of the things that would cause you to smile. Like, who doesn't laugh when children laugh? I mean, I guess, unless they're doing violence on their siblings and they're laughing, but you wouldn't laugh at that. But just, you know, you hear children laugh, what does that make you do? It just fills your heart with joy. Well, grandparent doesn't walk into the room and hear cackling grandchildren and their heart is full because it's lovely. It's like a warm spring day. It's like a juicy brisket or a good red wine. And just for the record, for the record, I'm admitting this publicly, I have jumped off the Cadbury's chocolate train. I am now on the Lint dark chocolate train. Not only because there's tons less calories, and over here in Cadbury's Chocolate, I can eat at least a couple of families block in one sitting. Oh, I can't do that with Lint Chocolate. It's just age is catching up with me. But nonetheless, so I used to think, oh, Cadbury's Purple, Melbourne Storm, isn't that lovely? Now, I picture Lint Chocolate. 
a little salted chocolate or something like that. That's lovely. Think of things which are lovely, which are good. And they don't have to be Christian things. Common grace means that God has adorned this world with good, wholesome, pure, lovely things. Think about them. He says, think about what's commendable. Things, things that you could commend to others. Have you read that? Have you been there? Have you seen that? Have, I, have you met my friend? Things which commend themselves to you and to others. Virtuous stories or situations. Perhaps a movie you've seen that's wholesome or, or, or courageous. Or about justice. And Paul says, if there's something which is excellent, think about it. Think of moral goodness and virtuous people and virtuous situations. He says, if there's something that you've heard which is worthy of praise, human activity or achievement, perhaps something in God's glorious creation, if it's excellent, if it is worthy of praise, and he's using this if as a, in a conditional clause. Like how you might say, if you see Ben and his family, the Duncansons, in, where are they? New South Wales or something? Yeah, New South Wales. If you see Ben in New South Wales, say hello. It's a conditional clause. You may not be in New South Wales, so you won't see Ben. But if you were in New South Wales and you did see Ben, something follows. Say hello. If you think, if you find things that are excellent and worthy of praise, if you could find those things, think of those things. It's just not rocket science. It's just that we become lazy and immune to this. It's just that we no longer talk about stuff like that. We, we teach people skills to get them jobs. And we've forgotten that our, that our calling as Christians is to remind people and to model for people what it is to be virtuous. That is character. What it is to walk and look like Christ. And that starts by thinking like him. In, in, in delighting in beauty and enjoying what is good. And, and whether that's in art or literature or architecture, science, politics, music, technology, trades, people. You, you have to train yourself to learn to see the good and the lovely and the virtuous. And then let yourself dwell on those things. Because I don't have to teach you to dwell on vices. Your sin nature trains you in that. Our culture constantly pushes you towards immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's the quote from Galatians 5. Paul's aware of it. Netflix, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, culture wants you to dwell on these disordered desires, these vices. Politics is shaped to make you fear things and want things. And you know, what, what makes it easier to dwell on all these things is we live in a cultural moment where we're surrounded by them with such ease. You know, for the last, what, six, seven thousand years, if, if, if I wanted to speak to any one of you, I, I had to find a camel. That's the first thing. Jump on my camel. And then I, then I had to do a big trip to come and see you. And I had to speak to you face to face. But now we're surrounded with technology and phones that never stop pinging. 
and we have this instant communication. But it's actually, while that is good and we can rejoice in those some aspects of it, it is also, as you all know, a constant distraction. A constant distraction. And you know it. Imagine if that day the Lord added up all the time on those videos on TikTok or wherever. All those things that distract you from thinking on the things Paul has talked about and has got you thinking about on what the world's thinking about, what the flesh is thinking about. And in the last hundred years, life has got noisier and noisier. It's not an excuse, it's just a reality. In the 1920s, we had just what? Background music. Had a radio. By the time you get to the 40s, you've, you've now got TV. But, but only for a certain little while, because remember, they used to turn off the TV. Uh, I don't know, I think even in the 70s, they were still turning off the TV about 10 o'clock at night. Then we got the internet. Then had dumb phones. And now we've got smartphones. And all of it, and again, because we're so used to it, we don't realize that all of it, it's just constantly demanding our attention and it screams at us, it seduces us, it distracts us and it does it one click at a time, one video at a time, one website at a time. And it's not that it's all evil. I am, I'm not against technology. But so much of it is a distraction that stops you from even thinking, stops you from slowing down, stops you from even contemplating. Because there's videos of little puppies or dogs getting rescued by some crane or tractor from a river. You've all seen that video, haven't you? No, don't worry. Well, good, you lost nothing. That was a test. Some of you passed the test. But we've all seen those videos, you know, soldiers coming home from, from deployment and then, you know, someone's got the video out catching the moment, which is probably staged, but it doesn't matter. And there's, there's tons of videos. Like, you could probably spend until you die, if you could sustain yourself that long financially, but you could probably spend the rest of your life just dining out on little kitten and puppy videos that are apparently cute. And there's also, Isaiah knows this one. He's watching, what's that? There's a video about a saluting pigeon once, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah that's right. I think we all remember that video. And the point is, this stuff consumes you and you fritter away your time and your thought life devolves. Imagine if I said to you, I'll give you $100,000. I won't do it today because you not wouldn't be able to spend it today because the Lord's Day. But let's say tomorrow, because it's Monday, and you can spend on Mondays. So I'll give you $100,000, and I say to you, you've got to spend the $100,000 before the end of the day. Let's say even say, I gave you a day's notice. So you've got all of today, when you're not worshipping and thinking about Jesus and serving others, to think about tomorrow, what you're going to do with that $100,000. And here's my guess. You wouldn't just sort of like walk into the shops and go... Willy-nilly. Well, a bloke probably would. But, but your wife will be with you, so you won't be doing that. You know what you do? You will give that careful thought, won't you? Maybe it'll go on your mortgage. Maybe you need to get the car fixed. Maybe it's going to pay off school fees. Maybe it's going to pay off your hex debts. But you will give it, you will give it a lot of thought what is the wisest way to spend every dollar. Yet we don't pay the same attention to our thoughts. And you waste your thoughts. You waste them. You waste your thought life. I wonder, the young men in the congregation, I wonder how much time you have spent thinking about what sort of man you want to be. As you sat down and thought, what sort of a man do I want to be? What are the virtues I want to pursue? What sort of a husband? What sort of a worker? What sort of a friend? When, when, when I 
when I take on the responsibility of manhood and I have a home, what will be the culture of that home that I want, that I've cultivated? And young women, how much time have you spent thinking about what sort of woman that you would be? And I'm not talking about physical beauty or strength, but the virtues that you are supposed to be adding to your faith by grace. Virtues perhaps that you've seen in others. Paul says you think about those things. But don't stop there. Verse 9 says, practice these things. Practice them. Look at verse 9. What you have learned, uh, the, the, the verb there is it's actually a verbal form of the noun to disciple. What you have been discipled, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Here's Paul saying that churches, Philippi, practice these things. Firstly, how bold is he? What you have heard and seen and learned in me, Paul says. As he fixes his eye on Christ, he's come to all to say, there are virtues in me as you watch me, as you follow me. Practice these things. That's what every father should be thinking and saying to their sons, every mother to their daughters. Look at me. Follow me as I follow Christ. What you see in me, those virtues, practice these things. The stuff that you saturated your thought life with, where you've parked your mind, he's saying, now practice these things. See, if you take the negative, because the negative is the one that we know so easy, what, 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 what young blokes growing up in a digital age have not been exposed to pornography? Virtually none. They live in a pornographic world. It is ubiquitous. For wherever there is a mobile phone, right there, tethered with it, is the access to pornography. And if your kids don't have it, your kids' friends have it. And it's not just boys, it's, it's girls. If you imagine growing up and filling your mind with those things, could you imagine that? Where you park your mind... It won't be long before that's where you park your body. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from, it, for from it flows the springs of life. As Jesus said, out of the heart of men proceed evil. Just as vices start as thoughts, friends, so do virtues. And virtues that start as thoughts, if you park your mind on them, they start flashing their way out as actual practices. Paul says, what you've learned and seen in me, he's talking about discipleship, how it's formed. Remember, like whenever we talk about Matthew 28, <clears throat> you know, making disciples, this is the shorthand, how it goes. Uh, what's our mission? Make disciples. How do you make disciples? By baptizing them, teaching them all that Christ has commanded. Dun, dun. It's not actually what it says, is it? That's a shorthand. That's how we all read it, but it's not what it says. It says you make disciples. How do you make disciples? You baptize them, and then you teach them. What does this say? To observe. Observe all that I've commanded. It's an observation game, discipleship. 
You watch, you fix your eyes on Paul, on Jesus, on the godly men and women in your covenant community. And as you fix your eyes on them and you observe the virtues, the commands fleshing out in their lives, you too follow in them. That's how you make disciples. It's, how, it's a heart of spiritual formation. It is observation. Paul says, you have learned or observed from me what you have heard and seen in me. Practice those things. Practice these things. If if you've got a, a dad who was a good father or a good husband, you know, who loved and cherished his wife, who would rejoice in her and praise her, provide and protect then you should fix your eyes on your dad and say, I want to be a virtuous man like him. I want to love like him. I want to serve like him. I want to be a servant like him. Maybe you had a godly mum. You know, the the kind that are patient and sacrificial, thoughtful, godly, wise. A mum who was warm, courageous generous, strong, whatever those virtues are. Maybe she was all those things. Maybe her name is Proverbs 31 woman. Then you should be virtuous like your mum. You should observe that godliness. And you put it into practice. And if you don't have a godly mother or a godly father as your example, then you're in a covenant community and you fix your eyes on those men and those women, whether they be young or old, who love Jesus, who follow Jesus, who are zealous for Jesus, who are courageous for Jesus, who speak truth for Jesus, who serve sacrificially for Jesus. And you fix your eyes and you observe that and you learn from them. And having thought about those things and you dwell on them and say, that's the sort of man or woman I want to be. I want to be like Christ, like they are. And you cultivate it. And you practice it. And you will grow in it. And that is how you enjoy the God of peace. You you are... You are justified by grace through faith, but your experience of the God of Shalom, his flourishing, his presence, his blessing, is experienced as you walk with him. What have we we been talking about in, in, in Philippians, about how you plod with purpose? Well, let's add to that. You've got a purpose and a prize. You're supposed to be intentional about your plod, But this plod with purpose, it is virtuous. Not virtual, virtuous. Paul says you observe these things and then you practice them. You practice courage. You practice generosity. You practice holiness. You you practice kindness and, and service. You do them, and you know when you're doing them, you habituate them. You habituate them by practicing them. It's like anything you practice. Whatever you practice, you become familiar with. It's like an extension. Whether you learn how to play golf or tennis or table tennis, whatever it is that you put your mind to, that if you practice it enough, you habituate actions. Malachi, like most young boys, he's always good for practicing, aren't you, Mal? You like practicing. He gets on his computer and he practices uh, in a game called Apex Legends. I had to do a little bit of research on this for this illustration. I've been wondering what he's been doing for two years. It's not homework. It is not homework. Maybe you have a son, you think you're doing homework, he's studiously tapping away. He's not tapping away. He's killing people on a screen. That's what he's actually doing. And he's practicing this day after day, hour after hour. 
Because Apex Legends is so important to life that you would dedicate most of your teenage life to it, right? Well, here's a suggestion, just, just a suggestion. Maybe being virtuous is important too. And Malachi is an easy, soft target. But everybody knows how we do this. Most of the girls and the women will know how many days and hours they spend uh, perfecting beauty standards in their home. Um, <coughs> clearly, some more than others. But, but their makeup, hairstyles. Uh, I said to Ruth, what's the other thing the ladies do? They're plucking their eyebrows. She goes, hey, no one plucks their eyebrows. It's called threading your eyebrows. You thread them, apparently. Uh, there's some women here who don't thread their eyebrows and spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. So they're probably like, oh, that's vanity. I'm not doing that. No, but they're honing and practicing their skills in the garden. Or Vicky, where's Vicky? Is she here today? Oh, she's not here. But you know why? She's probably at home practicing hammering because that's what Vicky does. Is Mrs. Brown here? No, she's not here either. Surprise, surprise. You know where she is? She's probably at home practicing shooting because that's what the Browns do. They shoot and kill things. Scripture says, do you know what? It's not that shooting is bad. Well, at least at animals, it's not bad. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Just, just. I don't want to edit. Look, go call the RSPCA. You know the Browns number. Just dob them in. But there's lots of good things. And it's not that computer games or plucking eyebrows or shooting rabbits or hammering nails day after day for that one day we have the NGPC hammering competition. It's not that any of those things are bad, but if you're seeking to practice those, but not practice godliness, not dwell on things which are good and pure and commendable and excellent and praiseworthy. If you're not dwelling on them, then you won't practice them either. The, the, it's the thought life. Think these things, then do these things, and you habituate them. That's, that's how you walk with the God of peace. That's how you experience God's shalom and flourishing. Because the more virtuous you are, the greater you will flourish. And the closer your walk will be with Christ. Think these things, he says. Observe these things. Practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you that you have called us to follow your Son to look to your servants and to observe the things that by grace or common grace are good and commendable and praiseworthy. And that we're to be intentional with filling our minds with, with virtuous thoughts. And then by grace to put them into practice, to practice these things to habituate them in our lives so that we will become increasingly kind and generous and patient and holy and our thoughts be pure and our lives be adorned with the very fruits of your Holy Spirit so that Christ will be exalted, our lives might flourish and we might experience your presence and shalom with us. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's um, respond to God's word. We're going to do that by singing our song of response. Christ is mine forevermore.
Please allow me now to lead you before the throne of God's grace as we pray together. Father in heaven, since all things are open before your eyes, nothing is hidden from you. Uh, you are the maker of heavens and earth. You are the maker of um, our bodies and souls. We come now together as those redeemed and those saved and those safe in Christ, we bring our prayers before you. We acknowledge, Father, that we are like grass. We have flourished and, and prospered, but with time, the wind has blown over us and we are cut and we will wither and we will fall into the grave. And uh, we acknowledge that we are like Adam, like our fathers and our mothers, those that have gone before us. We are sinners. And... We are lost and condemned in sin. But we give thanks, Father, that you show your love for us and your mercy, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ has died for us, and in him we have the beauty and the perfection of our Savior. Uh, we are the work of your hands. We have established your kingdom amongst us and within us. You have put your spirit upon us, and you have given us new hearts as we have learned of again this morning, new hearts that desire to please you and to bring honor to your name. And we thank you that we have a good shepherd who said, of all that you have given me, Father, I will lose none, but bring them safely to our heavenly home. We take this opportunity to pray, Father, for those amongst us that are elderly, who are frail, who whose knees ache, whose hands tremble. We would ask, Father, that you would renew the hope in their souls. We pray, Lord, that they would be always fresh, always renewing their spiritual life in Christ, and that they would say, uh, the Lord my God is our rock, and they would continue to bear fruit. We pray, for Lord, for those amongst us that are young and sprightly and full of confidence and perhaps some pride too, we would ask that you would grant them wisdom and that in your mercy they would humble themselves in the, under the mighty hand of God that in due, times, due time you might lift them up in Christ. And we pray for those amongst us that feel abandoned and perhaps have reason to feel that or left out, forgotten, set aside, ill-treated, for those amongst us that feel they deserved better, reminded of the promise in Scripture that says a, a dimly burning wick you will not crush, or a, a, a glowing amber you will not put out, we would pray, Father, that, that would be their experience. Also, Father, for those even that have felt disappointed by their children or children disappointed by their parents, we know that such things happen. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and nourish them and you would be their comfort, and they would know for sure that you, the Lord God in heaven, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, are their inheritance now and forever in the age to come. We pray for those amongst us that have played fast and loose once too often with sin and have got caught. Habits have become routines. Routines have become addictions, and... They find it very, very difficult to extricate themselves from those sins. We pray, Father, that you would restore to them the joy of their salvation and they would turn, that you may turn to them and bless them again, Father, and that they would know again your peace and the joy of following Jesus Christ, denying themselves, taking up their cross, following him and in his blessed company. Father, we think about the gospel this morning, that great work of the um, proclamation of salvation, the great work of establishing your kingdom upon this earth and every nation. We pray for your Christian church, for pastors, for church planters, for evangelists, for brave men and women that speak of Christ. 
We pray, Lord, that you'd grant them grace to be faithful and bold, and not to be ashamed of the gospel, knowing that, that it is the power, your power for salvation to everyone who has faith, Jew and Greek, man and woman, uh, atheist and Islamist, Buddhist and Hindu, all, Father, may taste of your gospel and your forgiveness. Grant them strength, Father. Grant that they would not be intimidated or silenced or surrender to fear or threats. We pray, Father, for those men and women that are, have responsibilities and positions of influence in Christian institutions and in Christian schools. We pray, Lord, that you would grant them also wisdom in the face of an increasingly hostile state. Um, yes, Lord, grant them wisdom and patience and that they would persevere. We pray for our families, Lord, our mothers, our fathers. Grant that they might be faithful and faithful in Christ, faithful in, in raising their children in, in, in the Christian faith. We pray, Lord, that they would be models to their children. We pray, Lord, we would ask for, Lord, that they would not abandon their children to, um, to playstations and to... Um, social media that can do so much uh, damage to young people's minds over the passage of time. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our parents and our mothers and our fathers with, with wisdom, Lord. If there has been sin in, within our families, we pray, Lord, that there would be ample forgiveness. And the children might grow up knowing that um, mothers and fathers, their parents can forgive one another and press on in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for the things we know about the Christian church around the world and how Christians suffer for their faith and yet have remained true and faithful. So, we, so may we do also if things become difficult for us, as your people have always done. We pray this, the same may be true of Bellarine Presbyterian Church and Inverley and Bannockburn and Geelong West. And we pray, Father, for th uh, those in hospital. We remember Daniel Vaness suffering from asthma. We pray that his body would heal and he would soon be able to return home to the joy of his parents. We pray for Irene Sanderson to have an operation in two or three days' time. We would pray, Lord, that she would have as much peace on that operating table or before she goes into that room as she does um, on any other day, knowing that you are with her always and you will never abandon her. She is always safe. <coughs> Father, we commend ourselves to your mercy. We would ask, Lord, that in all things we would be intentional to please you, to think of the things of the kingdom, to call upon your name, for we pray in the name of our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Now, if the musicians would arise, we'll sing again. Some of them are sitting already.
Just before I pronounce the benedictions, uh, LTG guys here, uh, you've got your baptism book, Jay Adams. Uh, come and grab them today. Uh, let's lift our hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.